Draco, I'ma have a flashback Digging through the dresser like fuck it, where my mask at? The mash back with the banger and damage shit And say fuck everything, I learned the name of management Hop back on some east side banning shit And push a nigga's top back when I let the cannon spit Start planning shit, premeditation I'm in love with the streets again, rededication Hey, what's cracking, YouTube? It's your boy, 16 to life, and I'm back like I'm on a pro violation. Yard down! And so today, we got something different from you guys today. Today, I got my first interview going on. This right here is Graham. And you know, since Graham is sitting right here, he's gonna tell you his story. We're gonna be talking back and forth. And uh, let's, so let's, let's kick it off. Oh, uh, before I get started, will you please remember to like, subscribe hit that notification bell that way anytime I drop a story you'll be notified also uh, I believe if you go to your notification bell and you put all if it's on personalized changes to all maybe that's why some of you guys may not be uh, get notified anyway with all that being said let's get started man it's gonna be a great interview so uh, we got Graham here today Graham so uh, tell me a little about a little bit about yourself so my name is Graham uh, I used to go by Casper inside uh, and you know, I'm a former uh, white supremacist, prison gang member, and you know, I did 14 years, uh, the majority of my life in the carceral system from 14 until 35. Okay. So now, when you say white supremacist, can you break that down? For, some For of sure. Us may not so, know, is there a difference between skinhead, or can you elaborate on that? So, part? white supremacist is the more conventionally accepted term. I was a skinhead. I was involved in USAS, and uh, it was a gang that was like blossoming in the late '90s, early 2000s, and I joined at a very young age, and that was my life for the majority of the years that I was out and the years that I was in. Okay. So, if you don't mind, give us a little background. You know how? To, of course, you wasn't. You didn't you wasn't uh, come out the womb skinhead and this and that. So, give us yeah. a little background on, on uh, you know your upbringing and all that. If you don't mind. So, I was raised in Huntington Beach, right near here, uh, Huntington Beach, California. Uh, it's kind of uh, middle class and then like bridging onto affluent community. Uh, I was not affluent. My family was hella poor. My mom and dad were in and out of prison. Um, and I was looking for something to attach myself to. I went through a lot of abuse as a kid. Uh, my dad was pretty abusive. He was a drug addict. He was addicted to heroin. My mom was too. Uh, so I found my way out of the house as much as possible and into the neighborhoods. And that's where I found <coughs> uh, basically skinheads. And it wasn't necessarily racial at first. Uh, it became that as we got older, it became more of an ideological thing, but as a kid it was really just us running around causing havoc, and, and it grew into something else as I got older. And now I have a quick question, like me uh, being, uh, uh, I've done 24 years, I had a life sentence, and in order to get out we have to go to, uh, to the board, and at some point in time they started bringing in these uh, self-help groups, and we mm -hmm. have to, you know, learn a little bit about ourselves. So I know that, and a lot of people don't realize that how we grow up sometimes, plays an extremely huge part on how we turn out or some of the characteristics oh, sure. that we develop. So you you um you spoke a little bit about uh, being being abused or, or, or physically had a physically violent father. Do you think that played a part in later on your aggressiveness and stuff like that? And if so please elaborate. Yeah for <laughs> sure. So like for me uh, Everything came down from a pretty early age, as far as I could remember, to proving my manhood, like proving like what made me a man. Because my father would constantly question me, beat me down, and uh, and so I wanted to validate myself and certify amongst all my peers that like I'm a man. And what that took was violence, being able to pull girls, money. Those were the things that I pursued, and I found all that in the skinhead mechanism. Like uh, violence was the key, uh, money partying that was another factor and girls were a factor so I found all that in that and as I got older um, like the image that I put out became who I thought I really was and so for a decade and a half I really lost myself legit like I thought that Casper was all that there was and there was so much beneath the surface right and so now so what I'm hearing is basically just like a key connection with all the games, whether you're Hispanic, whether you're black, whether you're a crip of blood, is, is, is one commonality, and that is violence. Right? Absolutely. So as For long sure. as you was as long as you was violent, willing to put your foot in somebody's ass, you'd yeah. be accepted. You know what I'm yep. saying? And that that's a key component in all these games. You know, because the, the more you the more you kick ass, the more people in yeah your status. Respect. It becomes status. Yeah. Right. For sure. Right. So give me like a little bit more of your background on once you started leaving the house and, and things like you say, cause, and then you, you made a good point too. Like when we joined gangs initially, we don't see it as a game. Yeah. We just, me and my buddies, we're hanging out. You know, we happen to have 
the same thoughts on some things, and then yeah. as we get older, you know, we this bond becomes tighter, and sometimes we get more in, in uh, deeply embedded into this type of philosophy or ideology, whatever we choose to use. So uh, explain that a, a little bit. Yeah, so, um, like basically, when I was a kid, I, I dove into the violence because that's what I learned at home. I dove directly into that. I became pretty good at it. I was a small, scrappy kid. I was capable of doing a lot of harm. Uh, so at 14, at 12, I ran away. I was on the streets for about two years. Uh, I'd stay on friends' couches or in parks or whatever, but that was kind of a part of the scene, like pass out drunk, be where you're at, and wake up the next day and push. Uh, so like at, at 14, they took me, they put me in juvenile hall, they made me ward of the court. Um, I was put through foster care group homes and I kept running from these spots and going back to the homeboys because that was pretty much what I knew to be my family. I had a grandmother at home but nothing really else outside of her that was what I would call stable today. Now I got, I got a quick question for you since you said you went to juvenile hall at 14 and I know I, I went to juvenile hall around the age of 17 and from my recollection I didn't see a whole lot of white people in juvenile hall. Not really, so, no. What was your experience like in there? Did you have it rough? Did you, did uh, other people, races try to pick on you or? No, I mean, as long as you're willing to fight, juvenile hall is fine. Like if you're willing to fight, then right. most people will, they'd rather see if you're gonna get down and if you get down, leave you alone. Right, right. So it's like one, maybe two fights, uh, as opposed to if you're not willing to get down, they will just ride you. So I just got down as soon as I got in there. Right. Uh, they have this thing like the day room set up in like a horseshoe and you have to stay, like you have to ask for permission to stand up. If you stand up without permission, the cops come. Uh, and so like they would just call you out across the room and say stand up so you stand up you get down in the center They pepper spray you pull you to your cell you get five days of loss of privileges uh, And after that, you know, you're pretty much good like I got down I was willing to stand up right. so everything it always comes down to proving your manhood like right. proving that you're down to do right. whatever And then of course the more you prove your manhood the more you become comfortable improving your manhood and and fighting is the norm e either whether you have a fear or you not have a fear you you realize through this i i get gained acceptance and for the most part most people will leave me to fuck alone for sure right and that, really the second part like i wouldn't have said that at that age and i wouldn't have said that in adulthood but what i really wanted was to attain a status where nobody fucked with me right because as a kid i mean i was a small kid i got fucked with at home i got fucked with at school and if i could attain a status where nobody was gonna fuck with me, then I'm golden. And so that's just what I did. I would go to great lengths to prove how violent I could be. And that ultimately amounted in, uh, you know, fighting a life sentence, ending up with a 15 year sentence and being in prison for the majority of my life. That's what it ended up as, so. So before we get deeply into that, let's start talking about a little bit about when you first started getting into trouble and things along those lines. For sure. So um, I was first arrested in like fourth grade for breaking into the school. Fast forward to like seventh, eighth grade, I got uh, arrested for breaking into another school. I don't know what my fascination with schools was, I have no idea. Um, but I would just continually break into these spots and, uh, and take stuff from them and get caught. So I got put on uh, juvenile probation and that was ultimately what led me to getting put ward of the court. I kept getting, I had a, pro, a probation officer named Vicki Kennedy and she kept going down to the juvenile hall and getting me out because they right. could do that when you're a kid. Right. So I kept stacking cases on top of cases that were going through court and she would get me out. And then finally she's like, that's it. It's, that's, that's, a, that's enough, five cases, that's enough. You're gonna stay in, so. So, okay, so what was, what was your first crime that led you to prison? The first crime that led me to prison was a uh, aggravated assault, terrorist threats, and uh, they charged with home invasion and they got dropped. We had, like I went up against someone who owed me money uh, and it was like some small amount. I can't even remember the amount. That's what's, it's pretty pathetic. But I went up against someone who owed me money. I went to his house. I told his people like he needs to pay me by this date. Right. I got hella drunk. I went back to that house on that date. I kicked in the door. We stormed inside and then uh, they charged us all. My co-defendant told on me. Uh, and I was facing, at that time, it was my first time as an adult, and so I was facing like seven years or eight years, and it got dropped down to a two year, and I did a two year term. Okay, so what was your first, I guess, experience in county jail like? I'm, I guess I'm asking, where did the um, skinhead ideology start to form? Where, so, where do you I'd think? I'd say in county jail, that's a, that's a good question. Like, so before that, there was a whole lot of loose ends to the, the whole thinking of it, right? Like, I would hang out with who I wanted, 
it wasn't really super ideological. We had some racist shit that we did, but like ultimately it wasn't super ideological. It was just getting drunk, having a good time, going to shows, whatever. And then I went to county jail and like everything's divided in inside, both in prison and in jail. Right. So in seeing that divide in Orange County Jail right here. So, me, I, I kind of I know what you're talking about, but some of our listeners may not, our viewers, so can you give them or expand more deeply? So when you say divided, you're talking about racial divide. Racial right? divide, 100%. The county jail separates uh, whites, Hispanics, black folk, Asians, all from one another. Right. And they group people together. So they'll group whites and Hispanics together because they say they program together. Uh, and that isn't always the case. So so they kind of, and I noticed as, as long as well, as, as well as the prisons too, so they kind of perpetuate For sure. racial Bullshit. The they create prejudice. those divides. They okay. create that shit because otherwise, if they put everybody in county jail together, it probably wouldn't even be a racial issue. But because they separate folk into different floors and different units, the second you cross one another, there's tension because you're like, I'm not supposed to be around this person. Because I noticed in watching some of these other uh, prison shows in other states, there's no racial racial separation. Not at all. Yeah. But I've heard a lot of people from down south and this and that say California is actually more racial than these other states because in these other states you know where you stand yeah california is kind of like a it's kind of like a facade i would say you know for sure and so it makes it easier for the cops to classify us they right. divide by race right they can classify by race they can classify issues by race anything 115s whatever so it's all for the cops benefit we don't really realize that you go into county jail on some small ticket and uh and you're just like this is how it is right so when you come in, so they, so uh, you know, give us a little idea of how that works. Okay, so you, you you get arrested, you come to the county jail. So what's up? You know, you got, you know, you guys, you you guys know me. I clown a little bit and shit. So when you come through there, it's like, what's up, brother? Where you from, brother? You know, so give, give it's us not a, necessarily give us like that. that works. There's also just like juvenile hall. There's a very few white people in county jail, right? Um, because the system's designed to take marginalized folks and pack them in there. So. Right. Um, in county jail, you come across maybe in a tank of 112 white boys, wow. even in Orange County. Uh, but they do have that approach. Like, they'll be like, Here's your, what's your paper? Let me see your paperwork. Cool. If you have court, court stuff, let me see what you're here for. They might call and have their people check up and see if it's all clear. And uh, if you're not there for a sex offense or something weird or you didn't tell on anybody, you're good. Wow. And you so kind of float from that point. So that's, so, so that's kind of deep. So let me, let, me, let me expound on that a little bit and make it clear for our, for our viewers. So when you come in... They want to see your court charges. Basically, what you, when you say paperwork, he's talking about your court charges. Yeah. They want to make sure you're not charged with anything that they frown on. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people fail to realize, even though we're inmates, we're prisoners, convicts, whatever the terminology, there are certain crimes that we frown on as well. And you will be ostracized and physically, you'll get you some lefts and rights upside your head For if sure. you come in there with the wrong charges. Yep. So they want to make sure that you are that you check out quote unquote return. you check out so yeah so so give us talk a little bit about that so like sex offenses child crimes uh some it depends on where you're at but sometimes even domestic violence cases like it depends on the nature of the crime all that shit is out like that is not going to fly through the general population and they will they'll put hands on you if you have any of those cases right now you know what i always found kind of like uh kind of weird i guess i would say is a lot of us convicts, ex-convicts, we don't, we, we hate the police. Mm -hmm. We know the police tell lies on us. We know the police, you know, will do anything sometimes to get a conviction. Sometimes they'll, I, I've got a, and I was just thinking about grabbing my damn cell phone. We, 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 we uh, when in prison, I got maybe about 18 write-ups, about at least 14 of them, the cops either straight out lied or they'd embellish. But yeah. I noticed the second that the cops charge us with a possible uh, crime that's not acceptable. We don't give any benefit of a doubt. We don't think about how they'll lie. It's just automatically, you're out. You For know? sure. Isn't that kind of kind of ironic? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we hate the police, but if the second, if, if they say the wrong thing about a certain person, it's like then we, we're, fully agree. we're quick to take their word. I fully agree. And I mean, they use that stuff. They use all the systems that we set up for ourselves right. within against us. Right. So, you know, the idea of being racially segregated is something that we did in the 60s way the fuck back. Right. Just so that we could have some sense of identity and be able to stick up for the people who we agree with uh, along common terms. Right. We come from the same neighborhoods, whatever. And they use that against us to create race riots and create all sorts of tension. They did the same thing with with specific crimes like we know uh, we know that there's a high rate I don't even have the numbers right now but there's a high rate of crimes 
uh, that people get charged with that the cops are just throwing yeast on everything right. so that they could get you to plead out. Right, right. That's ultimately what right. it is. It's all about plea bargains, but inside, like, you can only read black and white. That's right. it. Everything's super binary, you know? And so what he basically said is, you know, for you guys who may not understand the, uh, the prison jargon or the terminology, the, the, uh, the courts and the police will charge you with a super high crime they know you're not even guilty of. Yep. But the time is so extreme and a lot of people don't want to even take the chance of, of, of getting convicted and doing all that time. So they'll plead and they'll plea bargain instead of going to trial. They'll take a lesser. So maybe you're, you're charged with crime A and, and that carries 15 years if you, if you go to trial and lose. So a person will take a deal. Your lawyers and, and the district attorney will barter back and forth. And you, after a couple of months of going to court, you're tired of going back and forth to court, waking up at six in the morning, staying mm -hmm. in court all day long, or whatever it is, shoulder getting a sack lunch. Yeah, you're uh, handcuffed next to each other. So you end up a cell fucking man. They're offering me three years. I'll take it. Give me the three years, man. Mm -hmm. I go to prison. I do half of that. I'll come home. So th this is a a well known tactic that they yeah. use. Ninety eight percent of convictions in California. 98% conviction rate, 90% plea bargain. So that goes wow. to show you how often they use. And so let's say hypothetically, I don't take the plea. I go to court, I'm like, I'm going all the way to the box, which means going to trial. Um, if I go to trial and I lose, they give me the maximum. So if my maximum exposure is 36 to life, I'm getting 36 to life. Right. There's right. no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The judge will give that because the state has paid the cost to go to trial. Right. Um, and not everybody who goes to trial is guilty. Right. It just means the evidence is stacked against them right. or they don't have proper knowledge of the legal system, but that's just how the system works. Right. It's a system based on plea. They want convictions because it boosts their numbers. DAs are elected officials. They want that conviction rate. So, yeah, it's a fucked up system. All right. So let's bring it back now. Okay, so now you're back in the county jail. And so when does this or does it, the, the, you know, the, uh, the white supremacist ideology start? start uh, seeping in. Are they giving you literature to read? or uh, Not in how, county, no. How does, it, how does it work? So, legitimately, in my first or second time in county jail, uh, I got in a fight with a Hispanic dude, which is a no-no, right? Like, you ain't supposed to get down like that. You don't get down between cars or whatever, cars being the racial designations. So, I, I didn't like what dude said, and I got down with him, and I got in trouble for it, and that's when I realized that the only people, and this was, you know, 18 year old logic. The only people who really were thinking about me were the people that were the same color as me. Right. And so it got me, that simple. And sorry about that. Let me pause you again real quick. So you said you got in trouble. So you're talking mm -hmm. about with your own, with, with my your own, own race. Yeah. So, so they was upset that you basically broke protocol. Mm -hmm. So can you explain what, what, what for those who, who may have not known, what should have been the proper protocol? The proper protocol is go to someone who's in a position of power and talk it through to them. They go to the other car, talk it through and figure out like some sort of discipline for a disrespectful comment or whatever may have taken place. Right. Uh, and that very rarely happens in that form, right? Like usually both sides take up their position and it either results in tension or whatever. But uh, in this case, what I was supposed to do was go talk to my people, my shock caller. They would talk to their shock caller and see if there was some sort of resolution. Right. Okay. An apology, burpees, whatever, like a workout, I don't know. So okay, so because I and I, like I say, I, I see a lot of other prison YouTube channels, and so basically, in California, due to our racial politics, in most situations, in terms of well, in all situations dealing with another race, you're basically not allowed to be your own man. This, Absolutely, this dude can say the most vilest, disrespectful thing, and you still or protocol relates that you still got to go get permission mm -hmm. well actually you can't even get permission to hit this guy no. you got to go relay what happened and and his other people will take care of it 100 percent. so sometimes that you know because sometimes in certain situations he may some i may say say something to him and him graham watching my people kick my ass is not satisfaction for him you know sure. because as men we're told to handle our own business so four or five of my buddies may come kick my ass it's called a discipline mm -hmm. but graham may have wanted to get his own punch in so yeah. I mean, so to some people, that's not fitting. But this is how this is set up, you know. Because a lot of times I'll do I'll do stories, and I have a lot of these viewers get at me, and I like to engage them. But they go back and forth of uh, a free world solution mm -hmm. to a locked up problem. Yeah. And sometimes it's just not. Prison is a different beast. I know? wish it was that easy. It's a but different it's, beast. Yeah. It's, it, we create a, a subculture inside 
that suits the immediate needs. You know, like we are a bunch of people crammed into a really small space and we gotta make do with that space by dividing lines and doing all that. And it's not to justify the behavior, but when you're in an oppressed position like that, you do what you can to feel like you're at least thriving. And some of that takes positions of power, uh, specific workout bars, fighting for that shit tooth and nail, like that's just how the system works. So, okay, so once you got to the county jail, you ended up um, going to prison. So what was your first introduction to prison like? My first introduction what, to what, prison? Uh, if you don't mind, give us, what, what year was this? 2003. I got okay. my number in 2003. So how old were you at that, at I that time? I was like 19. Oh, so, so, so yeah. basically what we call a straight youngster. You Hell was, yeah. You was a youngster. Yeah. So what prison did you hit? I went from Wasco to DVI. And DVI okay. was called Gladiator School. Uh, they had a gym that had like 500 people on one side, so break down on the other. To them, uh, uh, for me, please. Du uh, DBI. So that's DBI's dual, dual vocational institution. And it's they call Tracy. it Tracy, right? Yeah, they call right. it Tracy. So it's up. Is it? It's up in like Modesto so area, mid California. Yeah, mid Central Cal. Okay. And uh, it was it was an experience. Like I got there and the riot was on. It was uh, blacks and Northerners against whites, Southerners and Paisas, uh, and everybody was like benched into their corners. I was on fish row, I received kites, and I decided I'm gonna max my time out. Two years, that ain't nothing. And so I just went out and did whatever I could, continually catching shoe terms, continually catching points, until my time was maxed out. So, okay, so what are you saying, you guys, is so the blacks and the northern Mexicans were in an alliance together. Yeah. And they were fighting against the... The whites and the southern Mexicans and the paisas, which are Mexican nationals. So that's pretty much the whole fucking population, the whole population outside of the, uh, the uh, others. Asians, others. So yeah. basically every time you guys would get, get released or come to yard or encounter mm -hmm. each other on some type of way, any yep. shape or form, it was it was on site, right? On it was site. on the cracking. Absolutely. Right. And, and from Fish Row, I moved into the gym. It cracked. It was a 56-minute riot. Um, the way that it's set up is, I don't know how to explain a gym really, but like it's a the, one of the biggest gyms in CDCR. Just a big old basement? I like just beds. Like a big old, so basically you guys, what he's saying is that the gym is, is or dorm is just like a big old army barracks. For sure. It's a big old giant, it's, it's, well, it, it, it's an actual gym. Yeah. And they just put beds in there. So are they are they bunk beds or triple? They were triple bunks. Tri yeah, they, they there were some from, doubles, mostly triples, no singles at that time. And, uh, and there was a cop station in the front, cop station in the back, and a catwalk where a gunner would stay. But in the first watch, I think there was a gunner, there was only one cop at one of the stations, and that's when it cracked, was during first watch. And maybe about what, two feet between each bunk? Two feet. So you tops. say some, some, of the, some of the bunks are triple bunks. Mm -hmm. So basically you guys are crammed in there like sardines, you know? Definitely. And for those of y'all guys who don't know, most prisoners, we don't like uh, the dorm living because it's no space. It's no you can't get away. It's no um, peace of mind. You can't. It's it just open. You're always there. Mm -hmm. And so explain to us what what that was like for you being a youngster, first time to prison, and this racial riot jumps off. Were you scared? Were you nervous? Because sometimes those those riots jump off when they're least expected. But then if you know there's tension, you can always be prepared. So you were, yeah, we what were was prepared. your experience like? And the funny part is that the, the cops basically let that shit happen. The cops like, let the shit happen. They just let it happen. Um, and I mean, I get it, we live in there, but still, ultimately, the cops let that happen. They knew what was building up. They continued to pour people into this dorm, this 500 person dorm. Um, How many people you think was in, the, in that 500 dorm? Do you think it was overfilled? Because most times it's overcrowded. And so at that time, they didn't have any overcrowded rooms. Okay. After this, like after Jerry Brown passed some laws, they moved all the people out of these gyms. But at that point, like that was triple bunks. The whole back area was triple bunks. It was super uncomfortable. And there was like 530 people on one side. There's a fence down the middle and there was like 230 on the other side. One side was called Y dorm. The other side was called Z dorm. Wow. Uh, and it was, it was uh, when it cracked, like people were throwing, they had TVs in dorms back then. People were throwing little bubble TVs. And uh, there was a wooden shower rack. People were throwing like wooden spears. There was all sorts of, weapons and everything. I mean, it was an intense experience. You were watching people get their caps peeled. It was very violent. I mean, you said it went on for 56, 56 minutes. minutes. The cops from the front and the cops on the catwalk left us because they didn't really know how to shut it down. They were firing blocks into there. They, I, for some reason, they didn't fire live rounds until the last probably 50 minutes. Um, and live they, rounds, okay, so you, you live rounds, rounds, meaning they yeah. have a, a mini, a mini 14, mini 14 which shoots two, two, threes. Yeah, and so they were supposed to, they should have fired in the beginning as a warning shot, even though it says no warning shots. Wow. They didn't do so, they just kept firing blocks. Cops ran in, tried to quell the incident, it wouldn't quell because there's too many people. Uh, so they left us out there. 
They left you guys in there. In there. Just they, fight. Yeah, and they did an evacuation call for people who weren't involved, meaning others. Uh, and I think some others probably scurried towards the gate, but ultimately we were just there going backed up against corners running in for what you could get It was intense. So you said you did an evacuation call So basically they're saying hey if you guys don't want to be in this riot or your race is not in this mm -hmm. riot hit, to, hit the gate get out the gate mm -hmm. So do you think there was any possibly any people who were involved in the riot whether it was blacks? Uh, maybe Spanish, may, that that left that maybe but probably I mean this was 2003 and right everybody who was in was like I'm in I'm right. not tripping right. the, the prison system is very different now with more people like choosing programming and choosing you know going home to their people but in 2003 not in. Prison was it didn't feel prison. like there was right. much hope prison was just prison you know and, and so I just want to say real quick you know most of us guys we've been into a fight you know the average fight maybe you're fighting with somebody whether it's on the streets or in prison maybe two three minutes five minutes tops and that seems like forever yeah so you, can, you, can you guys imagine fighting for your life minutes. when there's all type of knives you know for 56 minutes people yeah. are still, like you said they're throwing tvs they're breaking shit in the gym you yeah. know people's getting their their heads knocked off and big yeah. dents and just locks that, because they have lockers they have locks oh and, and that's swinging their locks and that's stuff. that's something else we didn't touch on mm -hmm. right there don't people a lot of people as a weapon they'll take the lock off their their locker put it in a sock and now they tie it around their fist or, or some of them hold it but they're swinging it and they're hitting people in the head. Peeling caps. Yeah. Straight so, back. Wow. So I know yeah. I know that had to be kind of like... It, it was honestly like at the time, everything that I saw was exciting. Right. I wasn't really scared. I, I knew that I could defend myself. Everything I saw was legitimately exciting. And uh, when I went to the hole for that riot, it was exciting. I was like, this is a new experience. For some reason in, in my 19, 20, 21 through 30s, uh, I just felt like this is just going to be an experience. I'm just going to do everything I can. So as a youngster, this prison experience and this riot, it was an adrenaline rush and it was basically fun. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, when I got out, I very quickly went back on parole violations. I did the same thing on parole violations. I did the same thing on the streets because there, was, there wasn't really ed any educational component that was taking place at that time. There was no self-help groups really, NAAA, church, right? I wasn't really trying to participate in any of that. So I just dug into whatever the culture was at the time. Right. So let me ask you this. Now you said it wasn't any like educational opportunities and it wasn't church though. Most prisons have churches. Had you had a chose to do some of those things, do you think you would have been frowned on? Yeah, absolutely. Because <clears throat> in in prison, like, so if you go Christian, hypothetically speaking, uh, or any religion, if you dig into religion, you have to dig fully into that. That means zero room for error. There's no, no, no cussing, plan, no, yeah, no drinking, both sides of the fence. no gambling, everything. Like, you are a Puritan. That's it. Right, right. Uh, and that wasn't something that I was interested in. Right. Not at 19. Because, of course, like you say, a lot of times us in prison, we, we, you know, we're like the rest of the world. We prejudge. And a lot of times we'll see people who turn to religion suddenly as a, a hiding mechanism. Absolutely. As a way out. They're taking the punk route. Or you wasn't a Christian on the street. Now yeah. all of a sudden God's important. Yeah, so exactly. like you say, anytime we catch a dude who's so-called religious or a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, doing anything outside of that that religious type of realm, you we're pointing judging. fingers. Yeah, absolutely. okay, now, now you're running. You're hypocrite, running. Hypocrite, you're, yeah. you're running, you're, you're hiding. Running. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so that's, so I understand. So when do you think, like I say, the uh, the white supremacy ideology started started uh, coming in and being something that was deeply embedded? How was it, how was it, was something that was more brought to you? Or? It, well, I mean, even at an early age, it was just an us versus them mentality. As I got older, um, like I was given books to study, uh, I chose to believe in these books. I was given material to research. Can you give I chose, us like a, a little bit of the literature that you Oh, for sure. Use? Like Mein Kampf, um, Mein Kampf, Imperium. There's a grip of there's a grip of books. Uh, any of the World Church of the Creator books, they were very very regimented in a racial ideology. And it wasn't saying that everyone else is bad and we're better. Right. It was more saying like we need to stick to ourselves because we're under threat. And something about that, something about that language stuck with me. Right. Maybe because when I was younger, I always felt threatened. And then when I was around these people, I didn't feel so threatened. I don't really know. I mean, I can't get into the psychology of it, but something about that language stuck with me. And as I got older, I studied more. Uh, 
and, and, and read as much as I could on every subject from revisionist history to uh, outside, of, outside of the scope of what our belief systems were, anything that I could take knowledge on because I've always been an avid reader. And, and, you know, and it just cemented itself in place. Right. So earlier you said when you, when you, when you uh, came to Tracy, you had two years. The ride was getting ready to crack. And for those of you guys who don't know, because I know some states is different. In California, unless you have life, you're getting out when they say you're getting out. You don't Absolutely. have to go to the board. Some of some other prisons you have to go, or other states you have to go to the board even yep. if you have ten years. Yeah. So you had two years. So at the most, all you two outside years. of catching another charge, Absolutely. all unless you was gonna do was two charge. years. And so of course, you know, we go to prison. We want a status. We want to be popular among our peers. So basically, you said, I'm, I'm going there. I'm 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 riding. Absolutely. Any any opportunity I have to prove myself or put a, another notch in my prison belt, mm -hmm. I'm stepping up. I'm taking that challenge. Oh, for sure. Right. So when so when you got out, do you think you were more the ideology was now where you, you yeah were you more of a skinhead? I, I would say I definitely modeled it a lot more in my daily life once I got out. Right. Uh, I started recruiting other youngsters. I started. So you got out and then started recruiting. For sure. And I'm assuming that by since you had been to the to to, to prison, it added status. It added status to those who hadn't been. Yep. Right. Because prison, uh, it's just a way station. But a lot can happen in the time that you're in there. It's just like it's a green room. You're waiting to go somewhere else. You're waiting to go back home. But a lot can happen in there, and all that shit carries to the street. So I had attained a status where people were listening to me, uh, and I kind of took it for what it was, and I just did more harm as much as I could possibly do uh, to cement that status in place, make a name for myself is the term that we use, and and uh, and encourage others to do the same thing. So how so how long was it when you got out before you were back in? You said you you uh you end up getting uh parole I did violations. four parole violations. Wow. Within I got out when I was right before my twenty first birthday. Okay. I was back in right after my twenty first birth, first birthday. I did some small violations and then at about twenty one and a half I caught my time now. I was only out twelve days on my last violation. Wow. I got out on October sixth, two thousand five. I was back in on October eighteenth, two thousand five. So now when you're back in on October 8th, you said, 2005? October 18th. October 18th, 2005. How much time are you facing this time? 36 to life. 36 to life? Yeah. Wow. It was for uh, attempted murder robbery. Uh, and I had a co-defendant. He immediately told on me. Immediately? Immediately start like within, by the time we got arrested, by the time they put me in the back of the cop car for victim identification, uh, he was telling him, yeah, he so, did this, this So is the cuffs happened. hadn't even hit his wrist good. He no. Had, he hadn't had his hands he behind his... He, in fact, incriminated himself by telling on me wow. because he took him to the house and gave him the stuff and got himself taken in. Right, so he immediately was, was figuring out how to do the least amount of time. Absolutely, you know? and he ended up getting about a quarter to a half of the time that I got. Now, now was this a, a person that you had ran with previously and you Not thought? Not really. Oh, so you didn't? You no, didn't? I didn't know him that well. Oh, okay. And that might have been a mistake, but we were in prison together on the parole violation and uh, I was out of my place, so he let me stay at his house. Right. And I was like, okay, he's cool. And then we en I ended up running into a person who had done harm to someone that's very close to me. And uh, I just, I brutalized that person. And it wasn't, I mean, obviously it wasn't a great decision, but I brutalized someone because I felt like retaliation was necessary. Uh, and I ended up catching all that time. So, all right. so ultimately, on this charge, this new charge where you were facing the life sentence, ultimately, what ended up happening? Did you end up going to trial and losing in trial? You, I you, fought all the way to deal? trial. And so, the way the courts work, for my co-defendant to testify me, we have to sever our case. I would not allow them to sever the case because I knew he'd testify against me and I knew I'd get life. Uh, so I went all the way to trial. I told my lawyer, I'm 21 years old. Anything over 10 years is a life sentence to me. So get me 10 or under, and I'm good. And he couldn't do it. And then at jury selection, we picked two jurors. I went downstairs, came back up, and uh, he's like, this is the only deal that the DA is willing to offer. It's a 15-year, 85. And so I'm like, 15 it, years, sign. 15 years, 85%. So essentially probably about, what, 13 years, four months, somewhere up in that? Less and that's, cons him. that's considering you don't fuck up and you don't... Absolutely. Right. But I was determined to fuck up because... I had lost my, my, my grandmother was the most important person in my life. She died like a month before I signed my time. Wow. And I said, there's nothing left out here for me. I'll just go up there. I can be someone. I can do something. And I just rode into prison on that, on that wave. Right. So you pretty much before you even hit prison, you'd already gave up hope. You'd resign yourself to, I'm back. I'm just to get my ride on again. So real quick, what was it like when you, okay, so when you, 
you done that time. You said you you got back out. Now on October 18th, you're arrested again. What is it like? Fuck, I'm back in prison. What? Is, well, I mean, it was kind of just a strategy session. Like I just wanted to make sure that I had all my ducks in a row before I went back up. I thought I'd get a parole violation because I didn't think they had concrete evidence on me. Right. Okay. <laughs> but they did. My co-defendant had told on me, so that kept me in county for about a year and a half fighting my case. Um, but when I got back up, it was kind of like, this is where I'm at, you know? Right. And I've looked for little glimmers of hope, like the three-judge panel. Uh, do you remember the three-judge panel when they were saying they're going to cut time, they're going right, to kick people right, out? Right. So I'd watch that and be like, I might get out, but really, I'd resign myself to, uh, to prison. That's and and for, for, for those of you guys who don't really know, the three-judge panel was basically, at some point in time, they were saying that California prisons was overcrowded and that uh, you know some guys that filed some appeals or whatever and there were some judges who was going to start looking at the overcrowding in California prisons and they were going to start making these um, I guess like allowances or whatever to start getting people out so you know sometimes in prison we latch on to whatever hope we can yeah, when it's sure. time to get out so everybody was believing you know the three judge panel was going to start cutting time out and they then didn't for, do for shit. a while there was a big people talk about oh the feds are coming in mm -hmm. the feds are going to take over that. Yeah. we're going to they're going to start letting people out and people would get so hyped and caught up into this you know and sometimes it's like a i guess they you know it's it's kind of like a well people just just get away from reality for you know, sure it's an escape they're so stuck because prison is such an isolated oppressive environment all it is is harm all it, i mean legitimately like society thinks this is the only solution that we have this is our solution if someone does harm then we harm them by taking them away from their family isolating them taking their rights that's what society thinks is a solution but legitimately it doesn't solve anything so when you go in there you're immediately for one stunted at the age that you're like i went in at arrested 22. development absolutely arrested development that's a real fucking thing you're traumatized by the things you're seeing and you're forced because of like toxic masculinity because the things we live into every day the social norms to model a behavior that says this stuff doesn't affect you so you'll find yourself five years in watching a stabbing on the yard and like trying to find seating so you're not stuck on the yard <coughs> in the hot sun right not concerned about that other human's life at all not concerned about what's taking place because you've learned to disconnect from all the so, shit so, that's so, really important. So let me pause you uh, once again for our for our viewers. You said so. You're knowing the stabbing is about to happen, and you're going outside to witness the stabbing. But you 100%. just want you just trying to sit somewhere to be comfortable. Yep. So it's kind of like um, back in the days. I'm 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 trying to think here of the, the gladiator days. Absolutely. So you're, you're going to see this dude get his neck took off or maybe killed, mm -hmm. and because it's excitement. You know, and my thing in prison was as long as it wasn't me, it was fun. Yeah, you know? and like, oh, for sure. like he said, it was it was a time when I thrived in going outside, getting into fights, or mm -hmm. watching people get beat up because it was excitement. As long oh, yeah. as you're not the one getting your ass kicked, then it's fun. So you say you go outside, and, you know and, that this is going to happen. You go outside, you corral with whoever you're with, your people. Uh, and you would make sure that you got a spot that's comfortable so you can view whatever's happening. You can even judge it like, oh, that wasn't that good. You know, like, <laughs> like they didn't put it in. Yeah, they, for they, sure. Yeah, they, 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 they boop, pop, boop. That boop, pop game wasn't yeah, all that good. Exactly. And and then and then when it's done, you go back to your cell and you're like, all right, that's the end of the day. Right. And, and see when it opens up again. And so then, like he was saying, so you go out there, you find you because eventually once the. Um, the police and the administration see what's going on, the COs, they're gonna put the yard down. And that might, you might be on the ground depending on the severity of the ass hours, moving, an six, hour, two, three hours. Longer so, you, yeah. so you're trying to find a spot to get comfortable for this this, this, this um, sitting on the ground that you yep. know is, 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 is coming. For sure, and if you're in a prison like, I was in Calipat and Sentinella, those are way down south, it's on the, the border and it's super hot, so 120 degrees outside, you're gonna right. need like, at least a, a, an edge of table to try to cool you off because that shit is hot. That ground is hot. Right, and they yeah. just got you prone out on the ground, like you said. Calipat is going towards for those for those of, of you guys who may not be in California. It's going towards Arizona. It's hot as hell down there. In the morning, it's already by seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. How hot is it out there? Uh, at seven, eight o'clock, you get the ninety degree warning. Usually, for for like heat meds, people who can't be outside after ninety degrees, they put an alarm out. And they say 90 degree heat warning is in effect, uh, and it usually by, gets by, by 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, 10, 11, it's like 110, 115 degrees. Wow, okay. It's hot. That's so, misery. you know, actually, for those who, who know in, inside of California and, and out a little bit, Calipatria is a notorious prison for violence. So, oh, for sure. So, uh, give us a little, uh, elaborate on that some. Well, Calipatria, um, I mean, they have, they have incidents of rotating between different groups to rush the cops. They got 
riots over, you know, like uh, over whatever little issues take place, turns into a big riot, spreads between yards, uh, and non-stop stabbings, non-stop. Every non -stop day you stabbings. come out, then you're down for a month, you come out again. That's the norm. That's just the norm. So you very, very regularly, very, very uh, rarely got regular programming. Right. So I know, okay, I, um, back then, the attitude was, what about, okay, when it was time to handle some business, did people care about going to the store and make sure they had enough commissary in their sale or sometimes like what they would do is is they'd say okay we're gonna wait until after second draw or third draw they'd let a draw run sometimes so not all the explain time explain what's the draw to, for the people uh, who may there's not first know. second third draw Depending it goes on, on the numbers right. on your cdc on your on your cdc number so if you have i can't even remember the numbers i'm so, gonna say like zero through 20 right your 21 first draw. through yeah your first draw <laughs> 21 through 55 or 60 or something and then Second everything draw. up about that is third draw right and it's, those are different groups that go to the canteen and can shop their their pull which is at that time was 180 i think right and so a draw is basically like he said during the first week like my number was k13077 so that meant i was third draw so if you had a number, your last two numbers was anywhere from zero to, like you said, maybe 21, you'd go the first week. Mm -hmm. Then if it was 22 to 55, you'd, you'd go, go the second, second week. week. Anything yep. beyond that, you'd go the third week. So sometimes they'll let everybody know, hey, we got to take care of some business. We know once we take care of this business, we're going to be slammed down. So yep. We're going to give everybody who's going soups and hygiene. an opportunity to go to the store, get some soups, get some food, get some hygiene, because we're going to be locked in our cell, maybe depending on the severity of the, of the incident, mm -hmm. maybe two weeks maybe four or five months maybe nine months yeah. so we all want to have as much food as possible so we can uh, do this Be little lockdown a little better a little so, look, so let me let me ask you this now a lot of people are interested in this what is it like when a white crip or a white blood comes to the yard any person who is white who runs with a group that's primarily black how goes, was he how was he viewed by um, it becomes an immediate target uh, and I don't exactly know where that rule come, came from because it wasn't always that way, but probably in the 90s, probably with skinheads, um, it, it just become an immediate target. So if you're a white crip or a white blood, uh, I think that you pretty much know, and this is up until right after the hunger strikes, uh, you know that someone's gonna come for you. The second they see you, they're gonna come for you, and there's a disregard ultimately in anything else that's going on, any business, any store draw, anything, and they just aim for that person. So that's the meter. We don't give a fuck what's going on. We might have, 10,000 cell phones coming to the yard tomorrow. Fuck that though. So this guy, he's seen as a race trader and it, he must go, right? Yeah, he has to go. And if he, what if he, so what if he's a white crib? He's not going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. I'm, I'm, I'm hanging with the blacks. Then they just rush him. They'll rush him and it creates a riot. And it kicks off because a riot. Because all his homies are gonna back him uh, and it creates a riot, yeah, right. ultimately. So why do you think so much like anger is du is directed towards him? Because he wants to run with the black, I mean, is, is, That's he, a good question, is he viewed man. as a race trader pretty much? Is that what it is? They, yeah, ultimately he's viewed as that, but I mean, there's white Southerners, there's white Northerners, they aren't viewed as race traders. So I don't really understand where it comes from. Right. I think it's just something to hate. It, it makes it, it's like, it, it's looked at like fun for most people. Like, right. Right. we'll just do this. And, and when you got nothing to look forward to, right that can be a little bit of fun. It's it's unfortunate. I really I never really agreed with that policy, but I've seen it happen and even been involved on plenty of occasions where that's just the way the prison goes. Right. And you made a good point. A lot of times people in prison, especially on the higher yards, you know, the, the higher security yards, you know, the one is one yard level one is the low security, minimum security, level two, level three, and level four. So on these level four yards where you have a lot of people with a lot of time a lot of them who are not coming home or some of them who not coming home where they think they're not so they lose hope mm -hmm. and so they look to start trouble they look to do shit to yeah. make excitement out of right oh for sure that's what the whole network of politics and everything thrives on the ability to get away with something or even not get away and prove your status like <laughs> if you're never going home the best thing to do is prove your status within a network of people within a gang or whatever like like that's the best thing that you could do so if you're never going home pretty much basically all you got is your penitentiary reputation. Mm -hmm. So once you lose that, you're nothing. So people who realize I'm never going home, so becoming somebody, becoming important where, where I'm down south and people are hearing my name in prisons four or 500 miles up north becomes important. Absolutely. Absolutely. It becomes, I mean, it becomes everything. And the quest to just get a feather in your cap, just be someone who's important so that nobody else can fuck with you becomes a 10 year, 20 year debacle for some people. They just thrive and, 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 and make every effort towards that, so. 
Well, can you give us a story if you if you if you can with maybe not mention the names if you don't want to? That's all up to you about maybe seeing a white crib or a white blood removed from a yard or incident. Uh, so actually, that was in Calipat. It happened on uh, I want to say B yard. Nope, it was C yard. So C yard, there was a group of my homeboys that were there. Uh, a white crib got there. Uh, they rushed directly across the yard. They stabbed him like six, seven times. A riot ensued. It got. It was really bloody. Like there was legitimately. I mean, it's only half, half the yard that's able to engage right. in that, but the other side of the fence cracks because there's a fence down the middle at two at building two. Can can you take us through those steps a little bit more, like in detail? And okay, so he the white crip hits the yard. So okay, because of course now a lot of times when he hits the yard initially, since he's white, it's not known he's a crip or a blood sure. or whatever. So then, but you see what cell they go to. So right, so that's what I'm saying. So the problem. That process works. So when he comes in initially, of course, the white people see a new white person coming in. Mm -hmm. So of course, they're gonna automatically assume that he runs with the whites. Oh, for sure. Then so somebody may holler out, "Hey, Wood," or, or something, something, and Along then so it, it, you know, give, so give. And us that usually scenario. he'll disregard because in most cases they're already aware of what's happening. If they're right. on level four, they've been in for a little bit, or they're coming right from reception, but they've been braced on what's gonna happen. So then kites start flying. So they right. go so, from building so, to building. So a kite is a small handwritten note. That starts flying and says, oh, we got a white crib over here. It goes to whoever is in control at that time, okay. and they make the call. Right, okay. Now, the call is always, if I'd say almost always, depending on what yard you're on, uh, to move on this person. Right. So then you strategize when. And it's usually the first yard release where you're out with that person. You'll designate hitters. You'll designate people who are going to rush in, do the work, which is people who are going to stab him. Uh, and th that's exactly what happened in this case is two hitters ran across and stabbed him They knew that there would be a riot because of it So everybody else rushed the second that other people rushed those two hitters uh, And that's exactly what happened. So everybody pretty much comes out prepared to rock and roll to get cracked for sure right. and, and whites are a minority in prison like right. they legitimately have right. less numbers So they will more more that more often than not get molly so they have to bring they have to bring weapons They have to bring the big absolutely. power. absolutely and so they are so like you said they automatically know okay we're up against it. Maybe it's only, let's just say for instance, it's, it's 50 of us on this yard, but it's maybe uh, 200 crips alone. Mm -hmm. In a situation like this, the bloods are gonna get involved for most sure. of the times when it's a racial thing. Absolutely. So now they're not only dealing with the, the crips, they're dealing with basically the whole Everybody. population. Now. Yep. And so they know, they know that yeah, because for, for a white boy, he doesn't know the difference between a crip and, crip and blood, blood right, unless right. you're deeply involved and you've talked to people. And and the same thing goes, like, black folk are going to run together on an issue like that. They're going to run together. Absolutely. Right. right. So, basically, have, have you seen <coughs> often where, where crips or white or, or white bloods hang with, uh, hang with blacks and you guys have to basically get the guy off the yard? Not as much as white crips. There's been a lot more white crips that I've seen. But, I mean, it does happen. It's been less prevalent than other racial riots over smaller things. But I mean, it, every now and then you get stuck with a situation that shows up like that. Right. Well, what's the difference too, okay, what's the difference between um, a wood, a pecker wood, and a skinhead, you know? So there's no difference between a wood and a pecker wood. And those are just prison labels that they put on them, right? Like on a wood on that they put on white boys. Okay. So white boys are called woods when they go in or white men, depending on the era that you're in. Skinheads are actually a gang outside. And when they go in, they unite in a way that in similar to how other gangs do. Like, you know, we may be, we don't really beef with one another outside. Skinheads don't, maybe occasionally, but inside, like, we're like, all right, we're, we're, we're skinheads. We have a higher level of discipline. We'll have a higher level of, uh, you know, racial education or whatever. Uh, we're willing to fight more. I mean, a wood is more likely to be a resident, a resident than a skinhead. You know what I mean? Right. Like someone who just went to prison and is not trying to get involved in anything. So just basically a regular white guy doing his time is a wood. Okay, okay. Yeah. Right. That's basically what it is. And so are you guys cool with them? I mean, are you guys trying to push like um, policy on them or do you, are you separate? There was an them? era where, where they did. They did do that. Um, and then from the big homies, from the people up top, the Aryan Brotherhood, that was stopped at a certain point. They said, you're not allowed to separate, you're not a get you don't control anything, skinners don't control anything. So that was ultimately stopped. Right. And now it's just all white people or white people, right. woods or white men. Right. So, okay, I know at some prisons, there's been an alliance with the skinheads and the Southern Hispanics, and then at some prisons, you guys will also get into it, right? So how does that, how does that work? I mean, is, is the alliance due to Hatred of blacks or? No, it's usually about around money. Uh -huh. Money usually, like we can earn money together or right. drugs or whatever. 
Um, those are usually where the alliances are all built. Any alliance that was built between whites and Hispanics is built on the income, like the money that can come into the system. So uh, it's not really built on the hatred of blacks. And you can find anyone on any yard and they're gonna buy drugs from whoever they can get drugs from. They don't give a fuck what the color is. They don't right. give a fuck who it is. Right. Uh, it's not supposed to be that way in the in the books, like on the rules, but that's how it is. So are you saying that, because I know that, that uh, Hispanics are permitted from doing business with blacks. Yeah. So are, are whites, are they, uh, you know, quote unquote, not allowed to? Not allowed to, but not a lot. It's not, it's loosely enforced. Right, because I know, I mean, when a person's a drug, a person's a drug addict in prison. He's gonna, gonna get, get his get dope from where it. he needs his dope from. Yeah. You know? And of course, he'll, he'll try to be more sly about it, mm -hmm. or more, you know, more uh, c covert, I guess I should say, in dealing with the person. But at the end of the day, this if, if, if I got the heroin, and a white guy is a heroin that's addict. That's where I'm going. If I want it, that's where I'm going. And right. So it's a lot less loosely enforced. There's, there's structure, but it's not as structured as their system. Right. And you know, a lot of times I hear people on my YouTube channel, they'll ask, um, what race runs prison? And so in your opinion, does a, does any particular race run the prison or how, do, how does that, mm. and, 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 well, I, and I don't want to say That's what I say, because I don't, I don't want to influence your, your, your answer. So what race runs prison in, in your mm. opinion? That's a tough question. So my gut says cops are in prison because right. they create, a, create the network that makes all other things possible. They, they do that. The cops are in prison and they make it possible for us to do what we do by ignoring or not ignoring certain things. Uh, but I mean, Southerners definitely got some sway in there. Right. They definitely got a lot of sway. They have a lot of, uh, a lot a lot more numbers. Right, numbers, right. No, numerically, they, they, they have numbers. So I would say cops run it, but right. Southerners are in a close second. Right, because I'll say in my experience, I've never necessarily, and, and I kind of like, didn't get involved in a whole lot of other people's politics, but I would never, never say I've seen any race trying to run it per not, se. Yeah. Each race is just trying to do what they do. They're, they're trying, trying to, to make be their money. They're not possible. trying to control the prison. Yeah, you know, they may have enough numbers to if kick ass or if something happens. But I've never been around a race trying to run a prison. They're doing what they're. They're trying to make their money. They're trying to get their cell phones in, oh, their drugs sure. in, or whatever. They're trying to be like you said, Absolutely. trying to be comfortable. They're just trying. They're to not be trying to. And a lot of people had that misconstrued. No race, in my opinion, has is trying to take over the prison. Yeah. They're trying to, you know, of course they may They're try just to trying to extend themselves as far as possible so that they can't be uprooted and shifted somewhere else. That's really what it is. So they get comfortable jobs that serve the population. They get comfortable uh, positions with like people coming to visit them, whatever may be the right. case. It's all about comfort because prison is just an uncomfortable experience. Right. And it's designed by design. It's meant to uh, dishevel you. So. They're just trying to take that little uh, discomfort and turn it into something a little bit better. Right. Now, I know almost in every single prison, one of the most coveted jobs is a porter in the visiting room. Oh, for sure. Now, can you can you explain why 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 is that position? A porter out here in California is where you clean up the visiting room or you clean up wherever you're a porter at. You clean up inside the prison, uh, inside the, uh, the living spaces. But why is that? Uh, job so so wanted a porter in the visiting room. Well, porters they are responsible for <laughs> making sure that anything that's left behind can get back. They're responsible for keeping point. They can get you private time with your partner. They like they every every little comfort level of prison uh, is based off of the visiting room right? in terms of the drugs that come in in terms of everything. So legitimately a, a porter is the uh, the middleman between the yard and everything that comes into visiting that can't go back with the individual. So you, you're talking basically illegal, illegal things, For sure. drugs, heroin, weed. Now also of course, now as long as people have been wanting uh, the job in the visiting room, the, the convicts, the administration also know that this is a job where most people are trying to get drugs in. I've, I've even seen certain races, blacks as well, when they have people in the, in the visiting room that's not willing to bring those drugs in a porter, they'll make they'll move they'll they'll oh, sure. they'll send people. Hey man, listen, you don't want to bring drugs mm -hmm. in. We need we, we're we, gonna take that job. Yeah, we're we gonna take that job. We, job. You gotta Absolutely. get them out of here. So the the prison. So basically, taking that job is a risky job because the administration know that most times the porters are the ones getting the drugs back. For and sure, they're, they're definitely gonna keep their eye on them. But people people they still want this job. The question is, why does the administration allow that? Like the administration knows exactly what that is and they still allow it but yeah they, they that you're 100 percent right that's exactly what they do it's a job for someone who is willing to do something 
it's not a job for just anybody. So uh, yeah, absolutely, I agree. But the question is like, why does the administration allow that? Because they know that this is what fuels everything within the population, right? Right. And, and so if this fuels every discontent that happens within a population, every level of disagreement, money, debts, whatever, then, then we have problems and we can add security funding. That's right. really what it comes down to. Now, I've done, I've done 24 years straight. How, how much time did you 14 do? on this 14. Last one. So yeah. I want to ask you this because I have never, I heard about it, right? But the visiting room is pretty much sacred when it comes to fighting and bullshit. Oh, yeah. Have you ever seen a fight in the visiting room? Never. It's a red light zone <laughs> because of everything that goes through there. And the you same thing goes with like here. areas like vocation where cops are bringing shit in or whatever. Like, those are all red light zones. You don't do things in those areas because uh, you're interrupting business. Right. Yeah. And plus, like, I mean, on a civil level, I don't want, like, you, you gotta act a certain way because you're out there with your parents. Right. All of that, that tension, all of the emotional tension comes right back to the yard. Right. So, I mean, a fight between, let's say, hypothetically, me and you in the visiting room, uh, it scares people. They don't wanna come up and visit anymore, but also economically, it's a really bad move. Right. And like I said, with all the time I've done, I've never seen, never. I've never seen a fight in the visiting room. I've heard of it one time at another prison, but I've never, you know. I've, I've never, never seen, seen one it. either. Yeah. So that's just crazy how, like I say, we can, they can say we're so, uh, you know, uncouth and so, you know, so wild yeah. and we're animals, but we have enough common sense to know there are still some s certain sacred spots Absolutely. in prison. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. That's crazy. So you spoke about going to the hole. You did a lot of time in the hole. Um, what was, what, oh, actually, and it's a bit difference between the hole and the shoe. And the shoe. So can, yeah. you, can you explain that to people? So the, sh the hole is administrative seg segregation. Uh, that is where you go when you get a 115 that carries a shoe term and you're hearing it out or you have court case pending or other things too, but that's basically short-term stays. The shoe is security housing unit and that's where you go for a long-term stay. So um, 16 months, nine mo even a nine month knife beef, you can go to the shoe, which is Corcoran. At the back in the day, it was Corcoran, Tehachapi and Pelican Bay. So I went to Tehachapi and, Pelican, and uh, Corcoran. I didn't go to Pelican Bay. And so that's where I did most of my shoe term, and I did about seven and a half to eight years in the shoe. So okay, you were in, you were in Corcoran. Is that is that is that the new uh, new SATF? No, SATF is uh, mostly mainline or different like different levels of facilities. Old Corcoran, it's four A and four B. Okay, because I know I was in the um, I was in the shoe in in, in uh, new Corcoran, SATF, and the way it's oh in the in the standalone building, right? And the way it's designed is it's like it's it's it's. It's designed to deprive oh, people absolutely. of of human contact, absolutely. and so normally, like you say, in a regular in a regular building, it's it's the building is kind of round like this, and so I can look out of my I can look out of my cell and maybe look over and see you, or look over and see another human. Mm -hmm. But the way it's designed in Corcoran, it's designed it's, the best way I can describe it is those ant farms we had growing up. It's oh, like sure. it's little rolls. It'll it'll mm -hmm. this roll go, then it'll switch over, and it'll go that way. So when you look out. All you're seeing is a wall. You're, they're depriving us of human, 100%. human contact, human uh, 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 interaction, yep. and things like that. There's no window. The window's up top. Right. Uh, it's like it's yeah, psychologically it's designed different. to fuck us up and drive us crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's that's 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 a trip. How they come up with all these type of uh, super reclusive environments. Yeah, it's fucked up. Right. I spend a lot of time in those units too. That's the ones that have uh, four pods on one side and four pods on the other. A B C D G F H I or F E F G H on the other side. There's like twelve pot twelve cells all right next to each other. There's no windows. You go out, I, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it, uh, it, it's like I say, it, it's it's messed it's super, up. Super. Yeah. And then they they give us uh they allow us to go to the yard to exercise, but like you say, they put us in basically we call them dog, dog cages. Runs. Yeah. Dog can you explain dog that? Cages. It's a uh, six feet wide and probably twelve to fifteen feet deep. There's a toilet at the back. It's caged. It's about three feet away from the other cage, so that you can't pass things you can still pass things but so that you can't pass them directly uh, and you have to go out in your you can bring a jumpsuit but boxers socks shoes shirt uh, and it's basically just for working out and you're out there for about three and a half hours right now I, I was telling a friend of mine that out of all the time I've done being in the the hole in the shoe is where I seen the most suicides oh for sure have you seen uh, people hang or, or you know I haven't seen people hang themselves I've heard about it um, because it's such an oppressive environment, like you have not, if you don't have mail coming in, if you don't have a TV, 
you literally are just listening to the sounds of other people in their cells down that echo down the tier. 24 hours a day. 24 hours a day. And if you have a good neighbor, you can talk through the vent hole. Um, but that's about it. And 24 hours a day, you go out for showers every other day. You go out for yard every other day. Some places run yard in a funky way where you get all your yard in the beginning of the week and you're in your cell for five days with just you in your head. All the things that you regret, all the things that you are hiding, all the things that um, you wish you could have done differently, you're just there with that. And it's fucking terrible. Right. Yeah. So, um,. When you when you first came to prison on the second on the second charge, how long were you on the yard before you ended up going to the hole or the shoot? So for my first several years, I only did six months on each yard that I was on. I was on uh, D yard in Sentinella, which used to be a G GP level three. I was on B yard in Calipat, which is a GP level four, uh, and I just kept going to the hole, getting a little shoot term, whether it was a battery or an investigation or whatever, and then coming out. And then I went to the shoe, came out, went to Tehachapi shoe for a staff assault, came out, went to C yard, which is the four yard in Sentinella. Um, and uh, and that was override. I had to be there because of medical, because the cop had fucked me up. They broke my nose, they walked in my face, everything. Okay, let, let, so let me stop you there, because actually I, it was crazy that you mentioned that, because that was gonna be my next question. Now you mentioned a staff assault that you were went to the hole for. So can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, what well, you know what 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 happened? What made it you know? Cause what um talk about a little bit before you get in that. Just a little bit about the treatment of of, of, of guards towards the inmates and this and that. Oh, and for sure. What made you um assault the staff? So if, if you did in fact because of the way guards treat us, we have rules like you have to post up if you see one of your homeboys hemmed up on the wall, you have to be there for it. So you because, have to stop. Yeah, because otherwise walking. the cops are gonna do whatever the fuck they want. Right. right. So we were coming back from Chow, they pulled my homeboy up on the wall and started searching him. Me and my celly posted, they told us to keep moving, we acted like we were tying our shoes. Um, the cop called my celly over, so I went over with him. My celly swung and I felt obligated to swing too. Right. And for, I mean, it was a very quick, maybe nine seconds and they molly walked us for right. my nine seconds of retali of getting them back for hemming us up they just beat on us for like 30 minutes so it was they, rough. They, they they beat on you right then and there right or then they and there. or they came <coughs> uh, to your cell oh no they put us down he swung i swung uh they pulled pepper spray batons they started getting us it was all defensive moves after that then they uh they got us down Hog tied us with chains. They put chains behind our back, chains okay. on our feet, and dragged us into the program office. Now we're covered in probably two cans of pepper spray, uh, and they're just stomping on us. They kicked me in the balls, kicked me in the face, broke my nose, this scar on wow. my chin is from that. Wow. <laughs> and there was nothing I could do. Uh, and they didn't even decontaminate us from the pepper spray. So conventional practice says that they are required to let us decontaminate for like five minutes. They had me put my face in the water fountain and spit water in the air because they were pretty pissed about what happened. Uh, so I got a, a assault on staff, and my celly got an assault on staff, and we went to the hole. Right. And on one of my prison stories, I tell a story about getting mace. I got mace from head to toe, and that shit really kind of like jacked me up. I was in Ironwood, yeah. and um, so uh, talk a little bit about that mace. What, that uh, mace, man, you got boogers flowing out your nose, drool that you can't stop. Your eyes are tearing. You can't. It feels like you can't breathe. It's just super, super hot. Everything was hot. <laughs> and you're like that, spinning. It's, 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 it's reminding me of my yeah. experience, man. You're and spinning I, and like all your dignity goes out the window. Like there is no dignity left because you got boogers already on your face and it's just red on your shirt. Damn. Yeah, it was rough. Yeah, that was not a comfortable experience. So once, so so they didn't decontaminate you. So they just put you. They put you in the cell after in the you've hole. been maced. They put in, us in the, the hole. hole. So then, the how cell. was that experience? So I mean, how did you get the mace off you? Because I know that once, once, once I laid in my sheets, the, the shit got all in my sheets. I wouldn't lay in the sheets. So my celly was already in there. I had to go to the hospital for stitches on my nose and my my chin. Wow. So they brought me in, and I'm like, I'm on a bird bath because I could still feel it. You feel it. The heat has died down. The second you put water on that shit. It heats right back up and it felt like, you know, I imagine a lizard feels like that in their cage when the hot lamp is on them because it just felt like the lights got to be 120 degrees. Right. My skin was burning. It every was time, terrible. Every time you open your pores, it seemed like it goes back in right there inside. and you feel it for for days and days and days. The next, the next time we went out to shower, I showered again and it triggered it again right away. Right. It was fucking terrible. So it was all in your hair, all yeah, that type of stuff. Everything. Right. And, and I was explaining the same experience. You know, that shit was so, and I, I was, 
I'm tripping because as I'm as I, I'm maced, I'm I'm thinking in my head now now because I had read stories where people had got maced and they died, and I said I understand now because you like you said you, you start breathe. to panic because you can't breathe, mm -hmm. and so if you have any form of type of asthma, it's going to be hell for you. Yeah. So I had to literally tell myself, calm down, calm down, and then in my situation. Uh, it was about 12 o'clock or 11 o'clock in, in the afternoon, so they're, they're pouring water on me, but it's in summer. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the water is hot out of the oh, pipes, man. and that's that's coming over my head. <laughs> Look, I'm doing this, and it's, yeah. it's, it's a horrible, yeah, it's a it's horrible, a horrible, experience. horrible experience. Yeah, I, yeah, and then, that's rough. And I've heard stories of guys who catch an assault where they'll eventually be moved to another another prison because if you go to, to the hole for assault and staff, they can't keep you there because yeah. they're, they're assuming that you're going to retaliate or, or the they're going to retaliate, retaliate. so yep. and then but i've heard dudes who still get shipped to other prisons the guards there still will come in their oh, cells sure. late at night and especially if you go to the shoe off that shit like they are not friendly with people who got staff assaults in the shoe they will not give you a mattress they used to beat the shit out of you but then they you know corcoran got some heat for their for their gladiator fights right but so now they'll just not give you a mattress ignore your calls they know you're there for staff assault they know right. because it's written on your door right right yeah right and so, after your staff assault, you were you moved or you stayed I there? I did. I went to the hole and then uh, went to Tehachapi. I did my shoot term in Tehachapi and got kicked out to 4A yard, which is a 180. And exactly. then I moved from 4A yard to uh, Corcoran A yard. Right. So yeah. how, how is your experience like in, in relation with the guards? Do you feel like the guards, the, do you think the majority of the guards uh, disrespect us? Do you think the majority of them show you respect or does it vary? How, how, how was your experience? And dealing yeah. with the guards and, and you know inmates comments. Yeah, for sure. So the guards, they're a part of a system that is designed to keep us down. So they'll tell you continuous. I don't think that they're I don't think that they're all bad individually. On an individual level, some of them are okay. They're good people. They're just there for eight hours of work or whatever. But their system is so exploitative that they know that we are a dollar sign to them. So I believe that their whole system, all of the training that's employed, everything is designed to keep folks who are incarcerated, who are majority people of color, uh, and also poor folk that are incarcerated, they, they are designed to tell them, no matter what, you're going to come back. You don't got no hope. Even if you got a date that's two years out the way, you'll be back. And so when you hear that messaging, you automatically pick that shit up and it becomes trauma, like trauma response. So you go out to the street and you're like, I ain't no better than I was in there. This is harder than that. They feed me in there. It may be shitty situation, but it's easier. And I feel like their whole system is designed to continually keep folks inside down. Right. And like you say, I've, I've, I've heard people get, when they get released, the guards tell them, oh, uh, you'll be back. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, they're, they're kind of like, they're picking at us and they're, they're fucking with our psyche mm -hmm. and then some of them are doing it to be mean spirited. Now, I have ran across some guards who were who just wanted to come in here and do the eight hours mm -hmm. and go home. But you know, like, you, like you say, it, it varies. You it, know, varies. it varies. Uh -huh. Yeah. And more often than not, they'll just be assholes because they can be. They have the power to be assholes so they can be dicks to us. You know? Right, right. So, um, speak a little bit more about the drug trade in terms of when 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 drugs are bought in, or is there is there a tax on the drugs that that oh, yeah, the white sure. inmates bring in? Do they have to share the drugs? A or third or? goes into the into the kitty that goes to the yard. If someone brings something in, then a third goes to like if a white so boy brings. Can you it explain in, like goes. the kitty a little bit? What what's the, the kitty, kitty for? The kitty is for the big homies, and the kitty is for uh, like basically all the shot callers they get a little piece so maybe he goes to pay off debts. just being a shot caller you just you automatically get some dope That's why so people would, otherwise nobody would want to do it because it's a headache you know right so if if, if, if uh maybe for instance josh goes to the yard mm -hmm. he goes on a visit he comes back with uh ounce of weed he's given a third to the yard the yard will decide the person who's in charge it goes to them and then they divvy it out based on what debts are owed, based on how it can level or make the experience better for white people in there. So some of that is used to basically keep the yard running smooth for the whole white yep. collection as as a whole. Absolutely. Now see that's 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 right there. That's that's unique because like I say, being being a, a black inmate, I never really talked deeply with with uh, another white inmate about that type of situation. And blacks, everybody knows. Our structure is horrible. We have no structure, pretty much, and that's why sometimes we're so unorganized. So in the event, there was a couple times when I'd go out there and I got weed, and mm -hmm. I didn't have to give it to nobody. You know, mm -hmm. there wasn't a big homie I had to come back and share it with. Now, of course, I would bless my collective in my immediate car, group. my homeboys. Yeah. You know, I'm from the Inland Empire, and so for those of you guys who, who may not know, 
the Inland Empire is compromised of two counties in Riverside, which is uh, San Bernardino County and Riverside County and all the cities within. So it may be at any given moment, we, we may have 20, 25 homies on the yard. So mm -hmm. I would come out for the homies that did smoke weed and I would, you know, I'd give them some weed to smoke or, or if they didn't smoke it, I'd still give them some maybe to go sell or whatever. And that was in the event, well, basically just because we're homies. Mm -hmm. and, but it also helped in the event if you happen to get in some trouble, your homies are there to support sure. you. But so what happens, have, have you ever heard of a situation where maybe uh, a white guy is going out there and he's getting drugs and he's being secretive about it and he's not trying to let anybody know? Yeah, if that happens, it usually, I mean, you know where it's coming from, right? right. Like everybody intuitively knows this is the source. So eventually it gets out and that person gets handled. Like that's not okay. Right, right. And then they might owe back pay. Like they might owe, okay, so you brought in da da da, so you gotta give that now and you could be okay. Or uh, they just get removed. So when you say get, get handled, handled, they yeah. get basically removed off the yard. And see, like Absolutely. I say, once again, we have a lot of free world, worlders out here who are trying to, oh, understand, for sure. who are trying to say, well, God damn, why is this guy forced to give his weed or give his whatever he's bringing in to 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 uh to someone else because that's all you got like you got you got who you run with that's when you go into prison you're told you're this by the guards when you go, get off the prison bus in reception they tell you who do you run with are you are you white southerner black who do you run with so you're asked this for those by guys who don't know when you get off the prison when you get off the prison bus and you go to what's called reception and that's the first prison that you're going to be introduced to and they're going to decide mm -hmm. where you're going to go do your time yep. they ask you in the basically uh the introduction mm -hmm. that who do you run with yeah where, and they do you? that so they can assign you a cell and they do that because they know that making those lines is easier for them to manage everybody if they had everybody doing whatever they wanted they couldn't manage if they had us running our own show even if we still did break into cars based on gangs or whatever they wouldn't be able to control us the way they do but they set rules and then go to the shop callers and say, this is how it is, this is what we want. So really, that's why I said the cops control everything. Right. And, and, and when I came, I, I first got to the pen in 1996. Now around that time and a lot of pens, you still had a lot of uh, convicts or inmates in certain positions where we did play a big part mm -hmm. in the prison being ran. Mm -hmm. Where uh, clerks, clerks and, shit, and stuff yeah. who type up, who done all the paperwork, because a lot of the, the police, they just sit back and give orders. Hey, they may say, hey, Graham, go type this 115 yep. up. And that's how a lot of information is known. So if a person is accused of doing anything he shouldn't, you have to go type the report up. Yeah, so that you used have, to be the way it was. So when, in your in, in your opinion, did that start phasing out and the cops start kind of like taking over control? Because I noticed they start building these prisons where now, instead of a thousand people on the yard at once, it's only 250. Mm -hmm. And that is to separate and conquer, you know, For conquer sure. and divide. So, when, in, in your opinion, did they start, you know, they invested in a system from Florida called SOMS. Okay. SOMS is Strategic Offender Management System. When they built that system, it's a computer system that tracks everybody, everybody's name goes into it. When they built that system out, one of the key goals was to eliminate inmates, people who are incarcerated, from having positions where they are uh, privy to any information. So very quickly after, within probably a year after instituting SOMS as their system, they started eliminating clerk positions down from like three daytime clerks to one. Cops would be required to write their own reports. Uh, and also like any of the management, like R&R, &R, all of that stuff started going through cops too. So over from probably 2015 on, they began eliminating those posts and creating it so uh, cops did everything or the computer did everything. Right. Because I know, like I say, in California, they have a term which they call over-familiarity. Yep. And so basically what it is, is they don't want an inmate to get too close, too comfortable with a, with a, uh, a position with, or any cop. With a cop. Yeah. And like I heard you mention where you had got to a prison where you had flipped a cop. Yeah. Basically, you so you had spoke to this cop, you guys became cool at some point, and you got him to bring in. I got, yeah, I got her to. Oh, got her, okay. Yeah. To basically, I probably shouldn't talk about Okay, well, then we, she didn't get in trouble. So, so. we don't want, yeah, yeah, we don't we want to talk about that. Yeah. But basically, just you got her to do your bidding. Yes, and absolutely. And as a result, uh, I did nine months in the hole after that on an investigation. They basically tortured me, uh, and that was at CMC, and and uh, it was a really rough experience. She got walked off. I got walked off, and I was in the hole for hello, Hi. hello, hello. I was in the hole for nine months on that one. So when you say she got walked off, you're speaking on, I guess, the um, they're, they're ISU. Yeah, ISU came, rushed us both, walked her off grounds, 
uh, and she resigned that day and then put me in the hole and I was under investigation. So then she resigned from being a guard. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. their union allows them to do that. Their union allows them to resign and face no no criminal conviction or consequences. Right, so basically you were under you were under suspicion of doing something that you shouldn't have. Basically over familiarity at least with a guard. Absolutely. In some shape and form. Absolutely. Now, so had, had you seen that a lot? Had you seen a lot of inmates where oh, happens a they, lot. they get get uh, cool with the guard and they get the guard to bring in things. And why do they get the guards to bring in things? Like, Because the guards don't have, like they don't really get searched when they go in. They have a lot of leeway. And most guards, I mean, they make a lot of money, but they want to make more. So a phone will be, you know, a $50 Go phone will be $1,000 in prison. Right. What guard wouldn't want to invest in that, right? right. So we'll give you the box, you load it up, bring it in, and, uh, and at the end of the day, you got a couple thousand dollars for you, several thousand dollars for me, all is fine and dandy. And so and a guard can do that maybe in a, so in a day, he can bring in maybe four or five phones, make mm -hmm. a quick 3000 Yeah, absolutely. Quick. And that's, and that's, he doesn't even need to do more than that. But most of the time, where they get caught up is they do more than that. Right. They keep going, they the keep greed, trying to the push greed. the, yeah. Absolutely. Like any other person, the greed kicks Anybody. In. Yeah. Because the markup is so exponential, more than, than what you would get on the street. Like I say, uh, uh, maybe a, a $2, pouch of tobacco goes for $50, $50. $100 yeah. in prison. Absolutely. Now I heard you mention CMC. For those of you guys who don't know, and we get sometimes a lot of controversy about CMC. CMC is basically what's known as California men's colony. And it's a prison that's real, uh, it's, it's unique. Mm -hmm. And so- It's like you know, a college campus. It's like a college campus. I think it initially was designed to be like an army barracks or something way back in the mm -hmm. 40s or the 50s and they converted it to a prison at some point in time. But okay, so now, I know for, okay, for the black inmates, for the Asian inmates and the Pisces, it's cool for mm -hmm. us to go to CMC. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of flack on CMC. CMC was never a SNY prison, mm -hmm. but it was a prison that it wasn't as much structure and certain things going on. So what was, 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 was CMC? Was it, it was not good for white people. So for white people and Hispanics, and Hispanics you guys were forbidden to go there? So what Unless was, someone could get a tip, which means someone who you're tied in with from the Aryan Brotherhood or the Mexican Mafia. And if you're tied in with those people, uh, then you can get either a pass or make money there. Right. So that was the avenue I went. I said, I'm going to make some money. This is what I want to do. And I got a pass. And I was able to make it good for white people to go there. Right, right. So it, it was because I know that for blacks, it was okay for us to go there. Mm -hmm. And so, what was your experience? Did you well, at CMC? Was it uh, it was was, was the money making? Was it was it good? Was it it cool? was, but the cops were hella petty. The money making was really good. There was a lot of people telling, um, but the cops were incredibly petty. They were always like, they I don't think they had a lot going on. And they they and treated so, us like it was a privilege to be there. Yeah, absolutely, they did. They absolutely treated it like it was a privilege to be there. And uh, so you had to really learn to navigate around all of that stuff. Try to be super discreet, humble, calm, and that way they wouldn't pay attention to you. But if they got a, if they got like a, an idea that you were up to something, they would. They, that's all they had to do was just fuck with people. That's right. all they did. All they they come on for eight hours. There'd be a shift of three, and they'd be like, "We're gonna fuck with this person now. We're gonna fuck with this person now." So uh, that was. Uh, it was. I still made good money there. I made right. good money there. Right. Now, I know at, at one point in time in 2000, I believe it was 2011, I had a cell phone. I ended up getting caught with a cell phone, and I was moved from CMC to, uh, I think it was North Kern. Okay. Now, a lot of the, the, the Hispanics and the whites that were there, would go in, they were going to that prison, and they were being attacked mm -hmm. for being at CMC. Yep. Now, why, why was that? That's because until you are within the scope of like something that I was doing, which was making it good for a certain group of people, making it good for white folk to come there. Until you're like in with that, meaning you've gotten cleared, you've done something to clean up being there, you've gotten moved on, then you can't be okay anywhere else. Right. And so there's a whole process that it takes. You gotta get boobopped, you gotta um, do some work, and then you can be good. Right, so the, after all that happened, you're, con you're considered good again. Yeah. Right, okay. And so how long did you end up staying at CMC? I was there for about, just under two years, I think. Years? Yeah. So. And then I did my nine months in the hole, and I went to CTF. CTF was that? Is that the fire camp? No, that's a correctional training for Solidad. Oh, Solidad, Solidad Central. Solidad. Yeah, okay, Solidad. Yeah. So, what was it like there? Did you continue to continue to like uh, quote unquote fuck up? Or? I did. Oh. I did. I fucked up for. I was at CTF for like four years. Um, there's a lot of groups at CTF. It was a super group heavy prison. So when you say groups, what, what like what uh, groups? rehabilitative groups? 
Um, they, they ran like training courses for leaders, coaches, they ran, they did a lot of AANA stuff there. They had like success stories, the organization I work for now. They had a lot of different variety of programs that people could participate in. I stayed away from all that stuff for like two years. Right. Uh, and then like eventually I was on C status and I'm like, I need to get out of my cell. I so went what, to a so group. So what's, what's C status? C status is where they take everything out of your cell for a period of time based on a 115. I got caught with a phone. So uh, they take like your TV, they keep you in your cell, you only get like two hours a yard a day, if that, maybe an hour. Um, you have no phone calls. It's like restricted uh, status. And that was what I was on and I was like, I'll just go to a group to get out of my cell because I don't want to sit here and stare at the fucking walls. And, and that was when I started attending groups more. I just dug into the conversation. There was a lot of people who were um, really like deeply engaged in working on themselves and that was something that was new to me in the prison system you don't see that a lot right right but all of these people here were just deeply invested in the community and in trying to transform a culture into something where people could go home from here people could like lifers were going home people could uh you know invest in themselves and figure out what they want in their future instead of just coming back and i really dug into that conversation